Um, I'd like to uh, continue by introducing our panelists. Switch pages here. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome Esteban Bullrich, the Minister of Education for the City of Buenos Aires. Next, uh, Lisa R. Jones, a school teacher here in the District of Columbia public school system. And finally, Emiliana Vegas, lead economist with the World Bank. So, we all know that a good teacher is essential to a child's success in school, uh, but there's a lot of debate right now over how to attract effective teachers to the profession and then keep them there. According to one study, half of all new teachers here in the U.S. leave the profession within the first five years because of poor working conditions and low pay. And with more than a million teachers expected to retire here in the next decade, we're going to need a lot of new teachers. So I hope some of you are interested. Um, our question is, what can and should we be doing to recruit excellent teachers, to get them in front of our kids' classrooms, and then to help them succeed and want to stick around? And particularly, what can you do as university students to increase the number of qualified, well-paid teachers around the world? Uh, so to get us started, I'd like to start with Esteban. Um, could you tell us some of the steps that you have taken in Buenos Aires to recruit teachers and then keep them teaching? Well, good morning to everyone. Um, I wouldn't for a second think that I have a, the correct answer to that question. Um, I think this subject is the, like the holy grail of education today, of the lost ark, whatever Indiana Jones subject you can think of. <laughs> um, but I, I would say there are three things that we are working on to especially retain teachers. And uh, by retaining them, making the teacher more of a respected individual in the society, because what we lost in, a, in, in my country, in Argentina, is the respect for the teacher profession. And that has made students less willing to go into the teacher career. So, for example, the first thing we did was getting really close to them. Go over the unions, in my case. We had started to develop a direct contact. I gave my cell phone to every single teacher in the city of Buenos Aires. I have 50,000 teachers. And each one of them has the ministry phone number. My personal one, not the one that the government gave me, the one that I'm going to live with. But that really, at the beginning, that was a big problem. Got a lot of insulting calls because teachers were left behind. But then it started to become an enormous tool to support the work they are doing. So I would say the first thing is support from the government, from the society. We need to get the teaching profession back to where it is, or where it was. Um, this is a city of a lot of monuments, a lot of heroes, civil war presidents. I didn't see any of a teacher. And each one of them has had at least a teacher that influenced his or her career but they are not recognized. So we need to recognize teachers. Um, Emiliana, maybe we could move to you then. You work throughout the world um, in various countries. Are there places where teachers are really respected and uh, where the profession is, is viewed as uh, Esteban would like it to be uh, with monuments and, and the like? Yes, um, well, there are at least three countries that come to mind as the sort of greatest examples of where teachers are highly recognized, uh, Finland, Korea, and Singapore. And these are countries that um, where students um, want to become teachers, and so the profession can be highly selective. In uh, Korea, only one of 10 applicants gets into the profession. Um, I think in the United States, it's the opposite. It's uh, um, basically uh, the, the teachers are coming from the bottom part of the uh, performance distribution of high school graduates and college graduates. Um, and uh, as uh, when we look at why that's the case, 
part of it, a lot of it has to do with what Esteban is saying. It's sort of a social recognition, but a lot of it also has to do with how teachers, um, what, what their work is like in schools. Um, their day-to-day -day work is very supported uh, with adequate infrastructure, with adequate pay, with um, career opportunities where um, teachers who excel um, are really uh, given opportunities to continue teaching with more responsibility, with more recognition. So I think part of the problem worldwide that we observe too is that um, it's very hard for a very um, motivated individual to look at the teaching profession as one where they can continue growing. So until we can change that, I think worldwide it will be harder to attract the best and the brightest. Well, Lisa, you were the teacher on the panel, so we'll probably rely on you heavily to tell us what things are really like. Um, but you've had some recognition as a teacher. Um, can you tell us about the fellowship that you participated in and how that has contributed to your sense of your job and your, and your prospects for moving up? Sure. Um, I, I first want to say that teaching is a tough gig, and anybody who teaches will tell you that you know, our, no two days are alike, and you must have humility as you come into working with children. I don't come from education. I was uh, an underwriter. My major was economics and finance. I'm also a filmmaker. So it's really hot to come from a different discipline because of what you can bring to the children. I'm just trying to answer the first question. Don't worry. The one about, I'm sorry. No, that's, we'll I'm get all there. over the place. <laughs> but I, I we'll want, get back to that. okay, thank you. I just want to say that, you know, with teaching, attracting good teachers. I remember when I was in college, I laughed at the education majors. I'm like, you guys are, what are you guys doing? Are you going to ever be wealthy? And I began to realize that it's a different kind of wealth you get from teaching. And that really in society with the way we're constructed, we're America, we're a capitalist society, but it's important to realize that money isn't everything. You have to care about the most important commodity, and that's the children that you're teaching. And obviously teachers want to make good money, and right now nationally that's not happening. I know when I was a college kid, I really wanted to make some money when I graduated. I, I don't know if I was shooting for wealth, but I just wanted to be able to pay my bills. And a lot of places, teachers were having difficulties just doing that. I also know that in society, in our society, teachers, this whole conversation around how do you see teachers? Are they valued? Are they held in the same regard as a doctor or a lawyer, you know, or a scientist? And the answer is no. And you think about the people that influenced you the most in your life as you were growing up, they were teachers. And I think that we need to develop a better understanding and change the conversation about teaching and change the image of teaching. And I've been meeting over, I'm segueing into the Teachers for Nicely Leadership. Done. Thank you, Teachers for Leadership uh, Fellowship that I did with DC in um, last year. And I had the opportunity to work in focus groups at the, board, at the National Board of Education and the Board of Education. And also um, over uh, where Arnie Duncan and those folks, we all sat down and did focus groups and had conversations around how to change the image of teaching. And the first thing is to change, it's, it's going to take a generation to do it, and your generation will do it. To change the image of a teacher being a school marm, walking around, not aware of the world, in some kind of, you know, you know those teachers that you had that were totally boring, not involved at all, class, the classroom was not an interactive experience, you had to pretty much force yourself to stay awake, and it's not fair to kids. I can remember being in front of teachers, I just, you know, I, I, my mind would travel to a different place, because they were so boring and not interesting, and not interactive. And now, we don't play that in DC. We don't play that. If you are retired on the job, you're, you're gonna have to find something else to do that can help children that's hot for you. But we're in the business of preparing young minds and being committed to that. So the, so the fellowship that I did during the summer allowed me to talk to the officers at the upper echelons of my organization, and I got a chance to share my views and also to share with them because they, they're in the corporate office. They wanted to see 
how things, how decisions they were making looked on the front lines and if they were working. So that was really valuable for me. And I also learned how things were done because you know this whole business of central office and the teachers and the language in between. So I kind of had opportunity to um, deconstruct the monster. So it was, it was a great experience for me. I'd love to come back to that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> You're not a DC. You mentioned something, Lisa, that I think we we should um, we should address, which is pay. Um, how big a role is the relatively low pay of teachers in this problem of retaining and um, attracting and retaining good teachers, Esteban? Well, I, I would definitely say that uh, pay, payment is part of the of the motivation, right? Um, to give you an idea, in the last four years. Uh, teacher salary in, in the city of Buenos Aires had increased 200%. So we made a huge investment in, in salaries. The truth is, and I think uh, Lisa is, is very right on that, I, I don't think that was the biggest change though. I think the biggest change was getting close to them and then going to other areas that I think, and, and Lisa was talking about it too. Uh, to be honest, I, I would listen more to Lisa than to me, <laughs> being she the teacher, but um, is having a very clear career path. I mean, we have to uh, give them chances of promoting themselves. The only way to grow in the teaching career in the city of Buenos Aires before we get uh, to, the, to the ministry was by age. I mean, every year you, you had a, an increase in salary just because you were a year older in the teaching profession. So we created stages within the teaching career that uh, didn't make them leave the, the, the career just because they wanted to uh, increase their income. So they could increase their income in front of the class. And I think that had a huge impact too. And the third thing is training. The world is evolving really quickly. And sometimes the teachers feel that they are f like lagging behind the students, especially with technology. We have uh, developed a program in the city that we gave a, a one laptop per child of every, uh, every single primary school. It's more than 200,000 laptops. Um, but we had to train the teachers before the laptops were there. And we retrain them every year, compulsory. They have to go through training every single year, the 50,000 teachers in the, in the system. And we pay for that, but they have to do it. And they, they, that gets the teachers uh, updated with the technology, with the knowledge, with, and gives them the opportunity of surprising the kids, which I think make classes more entertaining. Emiliana. Um, can good teachers be trained? I mean, have you seen consistent um, programs that work to, to create effective teachers? Or is it something innate that um, we just need to have the right incentives to get those people into the profession? I think um, given the large numbers of effective teachers in some systems, I think the evidence suggests that they can certainly be trained and that there are countries in the world and, and systems, to say at the state level, that are better at doing that than others, in, including in the US where you have so much variety across states. Um, I think um, there's, uh, there's a huge, as Lisa began saying, reward that comes from the teaching profession. That's that sense that you're making a difference every day. And I think relying only on that is a big mistake because while you can live off of that for a little bit, um, you can't perennially live on that. And that does involve continually supporting teachers, training them um, to perform at their best every day but also rewarding their effort. Because I think all teachers want to make that difference and they work hard. And sometimes there's a lack of motivation that comes from realizing, as Esteban was saying, that the only way you can be promoted and recognized is by just doing the same thing over and over for more and more years. Um, so when you change those two aspects, the support that you give to teachers, the quality of who you attract into the profession, and then how you reward and promote um, teacher effort, I think you can make a very big difference in the quality of teaching. Well, one um, way that um, is being pursued here in the US to change the way that teachers are paid is to pay them based on their effectiveness. And so far, that is based on their effectiveness in, in raising student test scores, um, along with other kinds of observations. And you're familiar with that here in, in Washington. Um, as these evaluations of teachers are being made public in some cities, Lisa, I'm curious, sort of how, you know, how is this affecting how teachers feel about their work and 
you know, is the opportunity to be rewarded for your performance um, exciting enough to, to sort of swallow the, the potential difficulty of having your performance be put out to the public like that? Well, I think that, well, first of all, in D.C., we have uh, a tool that's called Impact. And it is um, an evaluation where you, uh, they look at your test scores, about 50%. Right now, it's 50% of your test scores. And then the other parts um, have to do with the teaching and learning framework, which ba is based off classroom observations done by master educators throughout the year. And also, they have a certain portion of community commitment and other things that are unique to your individual school. Now, I'll be honest with you, when Impact first came on the scene, there were a lot of uncomfortable folks. And my thing is, because I'm a bit unconventional and a, a bit artsy, and I have a tendency, I'm a filmmaker, so I blend a lot of arts and visuals and all kinds of kind of things in my process of teaching in my instructional practice, I was concerned that impact was not flexible enough to support my teaching style. Because in seven years, every single one of my students, um, probably about 89, 88% of my kids are meeting AYP. But I, w I was worried about Adequate the document. yearly progress. Uh, for I'm those sorry, who don't know what AYP annual AYP yearly is. progress. <laughs> and that's a uh, no child Thank left you. behind prescription, right? Right, and I have my own opinion about that, right. but we, we don't go there. <laughs> um, but the doc, I had an evaluation by a master educator, and I did well. And I said, well, this, this must be a, a very smartly constructed document. This process is hot. Because it recognized my own innovativeness, but you're supposed to do stuff when you teach. You can't just go willy-nilly. You're supposed to have an objective. The children are supposed to be able to um, understand what you've taught. They're supposed to, you're supposed to deliver the content clearly. You're supposed to um, follow through and check for understanding. You're supposed to make sure that children feel a part of what's going on. All of these are components of our rubric. So in D.C., we've tried to construct something that allows um, a picture of what's required for success in the classroom. Is it perfect? No. There are times that the impact document and I have arguments. And in those moments, there are learning opportunities for me. But if you're teaching and you're doing what you're supposed to do, then you should do pretty well on impact. So I'm pretty cool with that. I, I just, you know... Do I like being evaluated by five times a year? <laughs> However, I'm doing my job, so come on in. And yet, <clears throat> excuse me, you read that um, teacher morale is, is at a real low point right now. And I think it comes from, partly from the, these evaluations, the, the, the sense that teachers are being blamed for our nation's education problems. Esteban, I'm curious if that, if you're seeing the same kinds of um, reactions to your um, increasing accountability in Buenos Aires. Well, you, you could go to YouTube and see some of the anger that teachers express to myself. So if you look carefully enough, there are some videos there that will show it. Um, I mean, I think Lisa said it uh, very well. I, there is resistance to change, even if it's good change, um, especially from the unions, um, because the status quo for them is better. Uh, promoting the best teachers will also change the way unions are working. So, because uh, at least in, in our system, the best teachers were not promoted. Uh, union leaders usually didn't teach. And, and so there was um, a, a, a huge uh, resistance to trying to make some changes to the system. Uh, but I, I would say that evaluation, we are going through teacher evaluation too, or, and, uh, but it has to be used. I, I, I wouldn't tie salaries to evaluation. Um, why, why, wouldn't, why wouldn't you? The, I was gonna go into that. Um, I think uh, say a teacher doesn't do good in an evaluation, but she's willing to go through training to improve herself. Is she deserving a, a, a good salary too? Uh, should we promote, uh, should we pay more to one that is a better teacher or 
to the one that is given the biggest effort? And I would say probably both, right? So what we are looking for is for passion in the classroom, for willingness to improve, for willingness to get to the kids' mind and make them learn. And good teachers do it, but also teachers that train themselves and are willing to go through training and are really uh, are ready to improve themselves also get to the teacher, because uh, to the students, because the students see that. They can feel the passion. I mean, you go into classrooms, and I go to schools every day, and you see when a teacher is tr transpiring passion to the kids or not. And maybe not of, the, not all of them will do good in tests, because tests are not perfect. So we use them to know what we have to do better, what we're doing well, and what we have to, re, um, to copy and, and, and promote. But we use them for that as a tool for our learning and making better decisions, but not to pay. I wanted to come back to um, the fact that you've given your cell phone out to, how many teachers are in your city? 50,000. 50,000. So um, wow. do you think that that has made a real difference in how they feel um, in terms of working with the administration, well, how they feel about their jobs? Um, let, let, me, let me share a couple of experiences. When I got to the ministry, it was a, 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 there was a big turmoil in the ministry because the last two ministers had resigned in, in 13 days. So we, I was the third minister in 13 days with, because of fighting with the unions. So it was very hard for me to go visit schools because there was a lot of resistance uh, politically. And I don't want to get too much into uh, Buenos Aires because I want this to be useful for everyone. But today I can go to schools and people and a lot of teachers recognize this. I get messages in my in my cell phone all the time. Um, teachers know that they can call and I answer. And, 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 and so there has been a huge change in the way that teachers relate to, to the institution of the government. And I think that support helps. And, and we see that in the way that they have looked at changes we have done. Um, of course there's still resistance, but the thing is, it's, we are very open to that resistance and we try to work through it. Uh, putting at the end of the day that the, the goal for us is that kids have a better learning experience and teachers have a better teaching experience. That's our main goal. And that has no ideology or politics behind it. So through that we have been able, and I'm, I'm, I'm here with Marcel Miguel who is a little bit of my, because I'm not an expert in education. Uh, I'm just a crazy guy that was willing to take the ministry. Uh, <laughs> Marcel Miguel is my education brain. And, and we have been working in, in trying to promote new uh, reforms and, and, and we see the evolution in the reception that teachers have to those changes. Uh, so I would say, personally, I, 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 I really feel that, that there has been a change and uh, we, we have uh, evaluated and we are uh, evaluating scores. Uh, it's too early to say there was an impact. Uh, um, we have increased the amount of students in the public system for the first time in 10 years. It was going down, 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 and the last two years we they have They were increased. leaving for private yeah. schools? Yeah. yeah, they were going to private schools and they came back to public schools. So all of these are indications that maybe there is a change, but I would be humble enough to yet to talk about success. I think we have to go through a lot of more uh, signs that, uh, that has changed, but we are, I think we're on the right track. Emiliana, maybe we could um, talk a little bit about how you get all of these uh, disparate voices who care about education, the different stakeholders, the teachers' unions, the parents, government, um, taxpayers, how do you get them to work together? Um, because union resistance has been a big uh, issue here as well, and uh, they have some le legitimate concerns about how teachers are being evaluated, how they're being dismissed, um, and the process uh, that they can appeal those dismissals. Well, um I, I, I was lucky enough to attend the Teaching Profession Summit that uh, Secretary Duncan organized a, a few weeks ago in New York. And one thing that came through clearly from the, the top performing countries in international assessments is that no country has succeeded in improving the learning of children and the teaching effectiveness without an alliance with its teacher force, without working closely, not just directly with teachers, but also with with union leaders. And that in some cases has meant a change in union leadership um, when things like what Esteban is doing is reaching out directly to teachers sort of 
ends up unmasking that the leadership was there um, perpetuating self-interest that weren't really benefiting the children. So I think when you turn around society led by government leadership and by union leadership to focus on um, the needs of the students, I think the whole conversation changes. I think a lot of the systems that I've worked in as part of the work we do at the World Bank, the conversation often centers around what are the needs of teachers and adults in the system? And when you change that conversation about what, are, what is it that we want to get out of the children, their experience, if we prioritize them, then it all changes as to what kinds of adults do we need in the system? How should they work together? I think a lot of the um, traditional systems focus less on um, leadership at all levels. And including at the teacher level and at the student level. Um, how can students be leaders in their own education? How can teachers be leaders in their own school systems, in their own classrooms, and beyond working with other schools and having networks of schools? Same with school leaders and then beyond um, from government. So th those are the kinds of things. I think um, also working with parents is very important. And a lot of developing countries in particular, but I'm sure also less developed areas of the US where parents um, are less educated than their own children are getting opportunities to have. It's not just that they have less skills to evaluate the quality of schooling, it's often that they feel that their children are getting a good quality because it's so much better than anything they received. Um, so they're not prepared to make more demands on the system. And how do we, as a society, help inform parents of what they're really entitled to and what their kids are going to need in this very fast-changing world is really important to make a sort of priority for education quality and not just attending schools. So I'd like to spend uh, the, the last five or so minutes um, with some specific suggestions and advice you might have, each of you, for uh, young people who want to do something to improve teaching and learning in their schools uh, here in the US and around the world. Um, Lisa, do you have some suggestions? Well, I think it's important to, number one, come to education. You will grow as a person and you come to DC, you'll get paid for it. And you, it's a tough system. I hate to do the DC commercial, but I, I, I truly want you to understand that in DC, we deal with inner city children and they need you the most in, in, in terms of just creating um, a, a person who can be in front of them that comes from a totally different area, a totally different discipline. Uh, than education and can show them what the world is like, to, to challenge their thinking, to make them see what it's like to think about the world, to be in the world, and to change the world. You guys are amazing. I am so impressed by the young people that I have been meeting and talking to and the progressive mindedness that you have. I certainly had nothing, nowhere near the vicinity of thought, thinking about the world and world issues that you guys have when I was in college. And when I look up and see, you know, folks walking to meetings in suits and they're young folks and it's before eight o'clock in the morning, then I get excited. And I think that, you know, in terms of teaching, what's hot? You know, being humble is hot. Come in, you may not have the same cultural background as children that you may want to affect. That's cool. Share their culture, you share yours, and help them grow. Understand, you're gonna have to engage families. That parent community engagement piece is incredibly important. That's the 100 pound gorilla sitting in the room that nobody talks about. It's the fact that many of these families do not have um, leaders and they need help helping expose their children to more opportunities and helping to expose their children to more to things like reading every day, teaching them how to do homework with their kids. It's, you wouldn't believe the things I do. I knock on doors in the projects. I, I'm the, the loud person that's coming and what, why can't he do this? You know, little Johnny's behind here. Somebody needs to talk. And holding not only teachers accountable, but parents accountable. And showing and helping folks that want to learn. So in terms of young folks coming to education, understand it's tough. But you can do it. Think about alternative certification programs like DC Teaching Fellows and Teach for America. Come make a difference. These kids really need you. And stay longer than the two or three years. 
And Esteban, what advice do you have? Well, I, I would uh, stress my first point. I mean, let's let's promote the good teachers. Let's get them to out out there. Uh, I mean, just I just met Lisa's mom, who was right there, and if she uh, educated Lisa, I think she needs a monument too, right? Um, <laughs> I mean, a filmmaker going into teaching. Uh, I think we need to stress the need for teachers. But if we don't promote the idea that teaching is the greatest career there is, because teaching is what guarantees that our world will be a better world when we grow up, then we're missing the big point. We need more teachers. We need better teachers. We need the best students, the best of you, should go into a teaching career because that's the way to guarantee that we're going to have the best teachers and get the best students. So I would look to promote the teaching career everywhere. And the only way to do that is to support the good teachers and make them visible so everyone can imitate that. And Emilia? And I don't want to be redundant, but I do think that um, the best way to make a difference is through um, teaching directly in classrooms. Um, I don't do that anymore, but I think that the experience I had in front of students really has marked um, what I do now. And I, I agree with Lisa. It's hard work, but it's also really fun. So I don't want you to think that it's just awful. Actually, it's, you know, I. I um, I have two children in DC public schools, <laughs> and it is true that um, it is a system that is making a lot of change and rewarding uh, performance. And I don't, um, so I say welcome to DC, but I also would say there's many systems around the world that need really good leaders everywhere. And so you can make a difference. It's, it's the one place where um, there's never going to be a shortage of jobs, except maybe as we all age <laughs> and, and people stop having kids, and that's not happening here anytime soon so you'll always have job opportunities the careers changing to really I think um, worldwide to try and reward the best and push for that because that's going to continue improving the working conditions and more importantly the outcomes of the kids that we so care about all right well thank you very much we're going to open this up to questions from our audience uh, there are microphones uh, roaming the aisles on either side um, so I'll go ahead and, and select a few folks and we'll have take a, a number of questions at once and then have a response. So um, right here in, in the white um, in front here and uh, this gentleman here in blue, I believe. We'll start with those. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, I'm here as a commitment mentor, so I'd just like to put it out there. Anybody that's here that needs help with their commitment and education, come talk to me. And I'd like to ask you guys, um, and specifically Lisa, who just spoke about impact, the uh, traditional way of evaluating teachers has been a summative snapshot. And we're assuming, the underlying assumption is that we're working with students who are on a level playing field. And they all can, you know, achieve the same, the same uh, goals. I would like to propose that as we look at teacher performance and learning, that we move away from a summative form of assessment, the snapshot form of assessment, and move towards a formative form of assessment where we are identifying goals for the teachers, providing resources for those teachers to achieve those goals. Do you think that this is possible in our lifetime and how can we uh, be advocates for this shift from summative to formative so that we really truly can cultivate the most developed whole teachers that can model what being a healthy, successful adult looks like to our students. Okay, let's hear the other question just so we have some, uh, a few to work from. I'll remind you. <laughs> I took notes. Okay. My name is uh, Travis Allen. I'm from the iSchool Initiative. We are a student group dedicated to revolutionizing education through technology. So we motivate schools to adopt and incorporate more technology in the classroom. So my question to you is, how do you see technology changing the role of the teacher? What is the role of a 21st century teacher as opposed to uh, an older uh, model of a teacher? 
So we could take seven minutes to answer those two. So I'm going to just say real quickly, does anyone want to respond to the idea of a summative versus formative uh, teacher evaluation? Well, I, I, we actually went to formative directly. So we didn't go through, went through the other one. Uh, and explain for those who may not know what okay. that means. W what, what we're looking at tests, uh, not only like test scores. So we're looking at the integral working of the school. Um, and as I said, we are not using it as a payment uh, or a salary uh, increase. We are using it to see how we can improve. 90% of the school success of a kid in my country can be predicted by his or her social economic background. So, I mean, I don't know about what the ratio is here, but I mean, we, we could never have a level playing field in, those, uh, in that sense. So we need to go to see what each school individually and each teacher individually needs and then give them the tools that they need to improve. And in that way, we are leveling the, the, the playing field. So, so we went directly to the formative. Uh, and we will be happy with Mercedes to share our experience, which is a, a, a very young one. <laughs> but uh, still, uh, we are very open to receive any criticism or, or help. I would just you know, like to say that parts of the impact, there, yes, it is a 30-minute observation that you get. And however, I think it's important that somebody goes into your classroom to make sure that you are meeting the requirements of teaching and to make sure that your students are learning. That is 30 minutes, but it's a start. The other piece is um, the test score piece is also part of the evaluation. And there's a whole conversation around the high stakes testing stuff, how effective is that, Finland is not doing high stakes testing. Japan is not doing high stakes testing. Their students are excelling. What's happening there? And those conversations are happening nationally. And I, you know, as I said, I've been up at the um, National Education Office in focus groups in conversations where they are really and truly trying to design a fair, um, as fair as possible uh, and consistent paradigm of evaluation for teachers, and that is looking at the observations, looking at the uh, instructional practice, looking at test scores, a percentage certainly. Right now we're at 50% in DC. Some people would like to see that lowered, you know. Um, and then also the community and parent engagement piece is huge to me. And that's the piece that I'd like to see get larger. I'd like to see, because when you, when you get the parents, you got them. I know if I have a child that I got the parent who did not care about whether or not they were doing well in class before, who wasn't interested in whether or not their homework was being accomplished, who didn't care if they understood their multiplication tables after I have been working on it for three months and I'm not getting any motion and movement. I know that if I can get that parent to care and that parent knows that I'm crazy and I'm going to knock on that door and I'm going to call you and I'm going to show up, then I got it. Once I get mom or dad, I got the baby. So Babies maybe we just easy. need to clone Lisa. Okay. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about technology and how that's changing the role of the teacher. Well, I got excited when you said that, young man, because I have a smart board in my room as well as my own film cameras. I wrote grants. Teachers I got to know how to hustle. So you got to know how to write grants, get other people to give you money to put things in your classroom so you can do stuff with your kids. And the teachers that aren't doing it are the ones that are dead because their kids are not getting exposed to stuff. So we do smart board interactive. I mean, an, ex an example, you know, I have a word wall. We do monologues on our word wall. We write stories. Building, you know, we build our literacy, we share them in class, we act them out, we go out in the community and tape ourselves doing it. You know, my kids recently did a thing with, the, uh, with their video cameras where they were doing kind of a monologue about their community because we have a tough community and I wanted them to understand, give me five good things about your community. Find five good people, interview them, get it on camera, and then create a monologue from those conversations at the end that describes why you feel you can make a difference in your own community. These are third graders. And so they made these little movies, and we all get together and show them, and they get really excited. We edit. We did a movie last year. It premiered at Ben's Chili Bowl. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, Grauman's Chinese Theater in L.A., but they got all excited. We got all dressed up and walked on the red carpet. They did a movie. 
So, you know, I, I, I'm incorporating technology. I, I'm insane. I'm a filmmaker. So I'm going to, any technology that I can get, and if anybody knows of any ideas about, you know, getting more technology, even more complex technology in the classroom, I'm very interested in it. Did you have something really you great. wanted to add? I'd Sorry. love to get to one more question, question if we can, but go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I mean, since you guys are all action-oriented and you want ideas for commitments, I think um, one of the things that, that worldwide is happening is kids ha are better at technology than adults. And so kids actually are accessing it, they're using it, and as education systems, we're sort of responding slowly to how do we incorporate this. If you look at the classrooms today, they look a lot like the classrooms that you all went to and that your grandparents and my grandparents went to. And that shouldn't be the case anymore. And one thing that I think is really needed is how to reform teacher education programs to really incorporate technology from the get go. And Singapore is leading that. It was very interesting to hear how they've um, re totally changed their teacher uh, education program. They have a Starbucks in the middle. Their library no longer is silent, full of technology, full of conversations, recognizing that the way we're learning <laughs> is um, by interacting acting by having a, a very um, welcoming environment where we can work with each other and where technology is, is an important part of the world. So let's take one more fast question uh, right here. In the front in the black shirt. Okay. Can you bring the microphone over, please? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay, sure. Um, okay. So we've discussed how um, monetary incentives will definitely recruit and retain teachers, but I don't think we've really touched the topic of how monetary incentives, too many monetary incentives, will actually recruit the best and the brightest. I'm worried that with sometimes too many monetary incentives and with these programs now that are forgiving loans or that are getting you to, into um, some of the best graduate schools and are giving you the best grants, I know of students out there who are using these opportunities, these fellowships, these internships, really just for a way for them to get into the, their top graduate school or for them to just make extra money on the side. And it's actually gonna reduce, they're not necessarily going in it because of the passion, but because of the sense that they're gonna be taken care of at least. And they might not actually last longer for five years because it's a, it's a temporary plan, but not permanent. How would you, like, how would you address that danger? We've got 30 seconds, so who can answer that short, shortly? Well, I, I would say, I mean, Look at Lisa. Do you think money is what gets it her passion? Yeah. I mean, I, I honestly, I, I wouldn't put mon monetary incentives in, in the center or anything. I, I mean, there should be good money, right? But uh, uh, the, the problem with teachers is not money. Uh, in, in my country, we invest 6.4% of GDP. 6.4%. That's more than Europe is investing in education. Uh, so it's, money is not the problem. We still have a bad education system. Uh, I would be happy to share in the working sessions later or the office hour, whatever you call them, uh, the technology issue and how we develop the One Laptop Per Child program, which I think had a great impact. But uh, money is not the problem. I want to really thank our panelists before we move on to the discussion question, but thank you very much for your insight and, and, uh, and feedback. There's so much more we could discuss, uh, but as they've said, th there will be some time to, to approach them later if you have follow-up questions. So thank you. So moving on to um, your discussion question, you guys are going to break out um, into uh, groups at your tables and take on the question, as change makers, what actions can you take to ensure every child has a great teacher? Uh, the panelists will move about the room. I'll be available as well. Um, and then we'll report back in about 13 minutes. Okay, so we're going to hear um, some reports from, uh, from the discussion groups. And I promised uh, some gentlemen in the back I was going to call on them first. So uh, do we have a, a microphone available in the very back there on the left-hand side from your perspective? Thank you, thank you. Um, my name is Rester Merriweather, and we are just discussing here with Kirk and Travis um, what we believe is that teachers need recognition, they need communication, reciprocation, and appreciation. For me, the recognition ties into basically creating a nationwide organization that recognizes teachers. It's to be an incentive, and as human beings, we operate on a reward system. Why not recognize the teachers that are obviously making a great impact and difference on a national level? 
as far as the communication process goes, this ties into simply talking to these teachers. This comes to bringing them out and saying thank you. Um, the other topics are appreciation and recognition, and I'll go ahead and pass the mic and let you guys hear about that as well. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to be real quick here. Um, like For me, like my best teachers weren't the ones where I got the highest grades or they weren't defined by my test scores or anything like that. That's what we often define great teachers as. We look at the baseline scores. We put top 100 schools like, oh, okay, this school district had the highest SAT, highest ACT. And for me, a great teacher is a great mentor, you know. Um, teachers don't necessarily have to always invest in us academically. They can be there as friends for us. So I was telling uh, the, one of the panelists up there that my second grade teacher, I still communicate with her. Why? Because she taught me all these life lessons. So if children can look up to their teachers, and maybe if the parent's absent in their household or the parent's not the strongest, because you know, you're not always going to have that great communication with the household, if they can always turn to them as like another beacon of hope, another beacon for inspiration, then that's what a great teacher can be defined as, in my opinion. So. And just to briefly add on to that, um, what Kirk was saying, the importance of the communication just comes into, a, like he was saying, a simple thank you, opening communication. A lot of teachers aren't even aware of the impact that they've had on us and a lot of people. A lot, a lot of people don't tell people, hey, you've had a big impact on me. And it's as simple as when the semester is over, sending an email to your teacher saying, hey, you made a big difference in my life. You, you taught me a lot of things. You, you pushed me forward. Thank you. That's all it, a simple thank you in communicating with your teachers and letting them know will go a long way because that's why they got in the field in the first place is to make a difference. And when you let them know they do that, then there's a sense of fulfillment that they can get and encourages them to move forward. And last thing is mentorship. The fact that a, a teacher doesn't necessarily have to be a staff person that gets paid to teach. It can just be as simple as being like a big brother or a big sister to someone and being a friend and uh, mentoring a younger person. And that opens up a network to where each and every one of us can be a teacher in our own right. So that concludes uh, pretty much our ideas. So thank you. All right, thank you. Anyone else uh, like to represent their table? Um, how about this group here in the front? On the right-hand side here? Yes, thank you. Hello, hi, I'm Jay Siego here to George Washington University. I had the pleasure of working with some really inspiring and bright uh, leaders in the education field. So our, our question was, as change makers, what actions can you take to ensure every child has a great teacher? And we approached this, everyone kind of contributed their own ideas to this. Just going to run through some of the ideas everyone presented. So starting off, we talked about cultural sensitivity. It's very important for, as Lisa was saying earlier, for teachers to understand the different backgrounds of their students and what are some of their needs, what, like where are they coming to in the classroom. We talked about lifelong learning, that after you graduate from college or when you're, when you're a student and you're not in school, it's important to learn, like continue that, continue that knowledge period. And then I think this has been mentioned before, but having teachers make personal investments in their students, taking the time to get to know them, taking the time to really, to really get it and really work to see them succeed. Also, a concept that we talked about is having ha providing providing a model that a teacher can serve as a model for their students to be an inspiring, happy individual to show them. One of someone at our table said that she had left teaching to go to law school. That she had left teaching to go to law school and to go to graduate school. And she's made a presentation to everyone saying that you can do this as well. That it's definitely achievable. And so, the final thing was also uh, redesigning teacher training programs. So to improve education, to improve the, the training for teachers. So as you can see, we had a lot of great ideas. I had a great time with this. So. All right, thank you. How about someone from uh, over on this side? Yes, they're in the back. Right, yeah. Our mic is coming to you. OK, so um, we talked about several different things, and I'll just go through. Um, so the first thing that we talked about, um, Emilio and I are from Georgetown. And uh, I actually applied to be a teacher, and I will know tomorrow. But, uh, so we talked about that, um, oh, Elaine Locke Initiative. <laughs> so, uh, it's in Chicago. In Chicago. Yeah, I work in D.C. Okay. right now, though. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, please don't. But, so we talked about that um, Georgetown University um, really does uh, a good, you know, a good job at letting us 
kind of feel our way through our education and letting us know that it is okay to be a teacher. And uh, right now, Georgetown has like the highest recruitment for TFA uh, this year. Um, and I think that really, like I said, when I came in as a freshman, I was in the business school because I thought that I needed to work for Goldman Sachs and I needed to make money because that's what Georgetown people do. Um, and, as <laughs> and as I came into my education and I talked to my professors and I said, hey, this is not what I want to do. I don't really like accounting. I really want to teach. I really like volunteering and what I do. And, and I didn't get the response of, you know, where well, you're not going to make any money. And I didn't get the response of, you need to pay off your loans. I got the response of, that's great. Now let's see how we can do this. And I think that it starts in universities because the people who are going to be educators have to be educated. And that's where they are. So you need to let pe let the students know that it's OK to, to be teachers. And that's how you ensure every child has a great teacher, because then you'll get people who want to do it. So that's the first thing. Then we talked we, about. We've <laughs> got just one minute left. OK, this real quick. Just so you 20 know. 20 seconds. OK, so then we talked about loan forgiveness. And then I talked about how DC has a thing where, um, in, ten in tenure. No, we talked about tenure. Um, in Kansas City and how some people are lemons. So um, then I talked about the thing in D.C. where you can opt in to do tenure or you can opt out. And if you opt out, you get a higher salary. And if you opt in, you get um, a standard salary. And that's it. Which is good, and I'm opting in. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, I think that's uh, all the time we have. Unfortunately, President Clinton needs this room. What are we going to do? Um, I want to thank all of you for your time. Uh, for, your, for your thoughtful discussions, and thanks again to the panelists. Thank Take you. Take care. Thank you.